Okay, great. Uh, so first I'd like to thank the uh, founding partner of this event, San Jose State School of Information, as well as the, is it California Library Learning? Um, for additional support as well. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to participate. So thank you to these sponsors. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about how to think sustainably about library conferences. And I'm also gonna be focusing on events large enough to be considered a conference. But even if um, you plan smaller scale events, I'm hoping that this can be useful to you. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to be drawing a little bit on my own experience so that um, you can kind of see some real examples. So um, you can't see me, but uh, my name is Mandy. I'm a librarian at Cleveland State University in Northeast Ohio. And I'm also the uh, conference planning committee chair for my state's local ACRL chapter. So ACRL is the Association of College and Research Libraries. And um, it's an organization that serves academic libraries and um, our local chapter in Ohio is called ALAO, sorry for all the acronyms, um, which stands for the Academic Library Association of Ohio. So I'm going to be referencing ALAO throughout. Um, that's the organization that um, I, um, I'm kind of leading up the planning for a conference. It's actually coming up in just about two weeks, which is terrifying. Um, and our conference was moved from in-person to online, so um, we had to go through a lot of the planning stages that I'm going to talk about here in order to um, give our conference goers a high quality online event experience. Um, I'm also on the online planning committee for the Open Education Conference, which is coming up in early November. So between the two, um, I'm hoping to give you some, some real examples from my own experience. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about why online conferences can be more sustainable. Then I'm going to talk about some best practices with an understanding that, you know, I, I can only really scratch the surface and hopefully uh, you all are able to share your questions and your own ideas. I'm sure many of you have attended online conferences that you found uh, really well done or you're involved in planning events yourself. So um, I'm hoping to leave enough time for us to kind of share our nuggets of wisdom with each other as well. So first, why move your library event online? And I was so excited uh, when Rebecca Smith Aldrich talked about the triple bottom line in <laughs> the keynote session, because um, that's really how I was planning to kind of frame the benefits of moving your library event online. And um, one way to think of the triple bottom line is people, profit, and planet. Uh, so if we look at each of those, so we look at profit or being economically feasible as a way to be sustainable, um, often online events have lower overhead costs. So it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's more um, affordable for the organizers of that event. Um, one thing I will say is a lot of folks assume that an online event should or um, has to be free, but often there are costs involved, and so um, that has to be made up for somehow. Um, but in the end, it is often a lot more uh, affordable to have an event online, and that ends up um, trickling down into lower registration costs for attendees as well. I will also say that a lot of folks this year have had to transition a conference that was supposed to be in person to an online format. And that can also be more expensive than, uh, than just planning an online conference because there are a lot of fees involved often with canceling venues and things like that. So um, that can also play into the economic feasibility of moving online. Um, online conferences can also be more socially equitable um, a lot of, there are folks who don't attend in-person events for a whole variety of reasons. Maybe they have a disability that uh, prevents them from traveling, or they have responsibilities at home that um, don't allow them to be gone for an extended period of time. Or maybe there are other limitations in um, their own workplace. Maybe they don't get a lot of permission to go to a conference for a long time, but they might be able to attend um, an online conference and kind of 
duck in and duck out when they have the time and um, participate in ways that are, are accessible to them. So um, I know that in my experience, sometimes online events actually have a lot more participation than in-person events because there are all of these folks who normally just say, sorry, I can't participate, but who can uh, kind of log in when that event is online. And then finally, kind of the theme of this conference, which I'm so excited uh, to be a part of a conference that's focused on sustainability in libraries, um, online events can be more environmentally sound. So obviously attendees aren't traveling. Even, you know, if you have a local event, people are driving to that event. If it's a national or international event, then you have people flying to the event. And we know that travel is energy intensive and especially flying um, really contributes to um, climate change uh, by you know, contributing a lot of emissions. So when we don't have people traveling, obviously, then we don't have um, as big of an environmental impact. I also find that a lot of events have food involved and that can create a lot of waste, whether it's the dinnerware that's used and whether that is just gonna be thrown out or the fact that at most events you have to make more food than people generally will eat. Um, and then you end up with a lot of food waste. All of that is eliminated if everyone's just at home um, or you know, in, their, uh, in their home environment and can provide their own food, exactly what they need. Um, and then I also find that at some library events we have um, an interest in swag and exchanging swag. And it is kind of a nice feeling to get some free stuff, but a lot of that swag is made out of plastic and is probably gonna be used a few times and then will continue to exist forever. So um, in an online event, we don't really exchange swag at all. And uh, we can just really focus on the point of the event, which is to develop professionally. And we don't need the swag. So those are just a few reasons why an online event can be more sustainable. I will also say, um, you know, I, I have experienced this too, and I hear this a lot, that there are things that are lost in an online event that you don't really, that, that you experience in an in-person event. And you can't really replicate, um, you know, running into a colleague and having a discussion in the hallway, things like that. And there are technologies that are trying to, you, um, replicate that experience more and more, but um, it is kind of a trade-off and you have to decide um, what's, what's going to best meet the needs of your attendees. But I also think that sometimes these sustainability related outcomes don't get as much credit as they deserve in that discussion. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some best practices for planning an online event. And here's where if you have ideas, please feel free to jump in. I'm going to be drawing from, as I said, the ALAO conference that I am helping to plan. And this is our homepage. And maybe I will just escape this and give you the URL in case you want to check it out. Um, I'm going to shamelessly plug the conference because registration is still open until Friday. And um, it's, it's pretty inexpensive. So, um, and because I was in charge of planning it, I chose the theme for the conference. And so I chose resilience as the theme. And we're really excited because Rebecca Smith Aldrich is our keynote speaker as well. Um, so it should be a really great conference. Um, but as I said, we plan to have this in person. It's an annual in-person conference. Um, we usually have around 250 people attend. But about six months out, we made the decision to move the event online completely. And so we had to make a lot of the decisions that I'm gonna talk about momentarily. So the first thing that you wanna do when you're planning an online event is to put together a planning team, which is what you would do for an in-person event as well. But it's really important that on your planning team, you, had you have volunteers who understand the technology that you're gonna be using to pull off the event, whether that's using Zoom or another online platform, um, creating a website, answering tech questions, um, it's important always, but I think it's just really, really essential for an online conference. Um, and you may also actually uh, look for volunteers from your organization or outside your planning committee to help during the day of the event. Um, we we found that there there's a lot that needs to be 
monitored and taken care of, so you may have to reach out for additional volunteers with those special skills. You'll also need to consider the technology that's going to underlie the event, obviously, but whatever technology you use is going to impact a whole lot of the aspects of the event from how the participants will get to the content, um, how that content is going to be saved and be viewable later, how the participants will interact with one another, which is really important, um, and also accessibility considerations. How much can the technology provide and how much are you going to have to provide yourself? Um, and you see on the left that uh, some options that um, we looked into. Um, especially the open ed conference, they looked into a lot of these different options. They chose Cvent and their event is quite large. Um, we were considering using Whova. They have a really nice networking feature and they have an app that you can use. Um, but we, what we ended up deciding was to build our own uh, website. This is for the ALAO conference, um, which has been really great, but I will tell you, <laughs> It is a lot of work, so you really need folks who are really committed to putting in a lot of time and energy to create the website for you. Um, if that's going to be kind of the platform that will um, underlie your event. Um, so I think they did a fabulous job. But anyways, this is a list of, of platforms that you can consider and lots of these platforms are kind of cropping up, um, especially in the last six months or so. Um, and there are lots of options for how much money you're willing to, to commit and, and what features you want to use. So you can check those out. Um, obviously, you'll also need to consider the event elements and the schedule. So a typical conference has things like presentations and posters and discussion groups and vendors, like a vendor fair. Um, plenary sessions where everyone comes together, um, networking opportunities where people interact with, with each other. So how can you uh, replicate those in the online environment and which things do you want to maybe uh, get rid of? Maybe they're just not feasible and um, which things do you really want to put a lot of time and energy into? So if you kind of split up those sorts of events um, into three different categories, you can have pre-recorded um, sessions and pre-recorded sessions um, re completely <laughs> reduce, they reduce the risk of technology issues. So you're not going to worry that the speaker, you know, doesn't have internet access. Maybe their power goes out or their mic isn't working or something like that. If they have pre-recorded the session, you don't have to worry about that. You're just worrying about giving the attendees access. However, um, on the negative side, a pre-recorded session allows for fewer opportunities for engagement. So attendees can't uh, react in real time and get feedback from the speaker. Uh, what I've seen done and what we're planning to do is to have a pre-recorded session with a live Q&A or discussion afterward. And that can be a great way to, you know, eliminate a lot of the technology problems, but also have interaction that is um, robust and, and has a lot of back and forth and things like that. I've also seen pre-recorded sessions with sort of an asynchronous discussion, so kind of like a, like a comment posting area, um, and that can also allow for some interaction from the audience. Um, with a live session, you could have a failure in technology that could be very bad. <laughs> But attendees can ask questions in real time. And I think there's also sort of a sense by the attendees, like I am, I am attending this event right now. It's happening right now. That is lost a little bit when everybody's just watching it on their own separately. Um, and I'll talk about this later, but it also could result in folks not really setting aside the time to really be present and, and attend that event. So we decided to have our keynote sessions and our pre-conference sessions, which are more interactive, be live for our ALAO event. And then I have just another category I called asynchronous. Essentially, this is other kinds of format, uh, formats of material that you might have attendee or have presenters share. So things like PDFs or um, infographics, you know, PowerPoint slides that you can page through. Um, this is how we are doing our poster sessions. Um, folks who, who are presenting those can use any media that they would like and they can, um, we'll, we'll post that and folks can just 
take a look at that when they have the time. And we added some asynchronous engagement, kind of like I described earlier, where folks can leave comments and the presenters can come back and, and take a look and um, answer the questions or respond to those comments. So that's another option. Um, this is another option that might work for vendors. If you have vendors, they might be able to leave some asynchronous content. Um, working with vendors is a little tricky in the online environment to ensure that they have um, a valuable experience and they want to continue to contribute to your event. So this is a way to kind of involve them as well. Obviously, the kind of session that you're looking at in some senses will impact what kind of format you're using. So you're not going to be able to have a pre-recorded discussion. Uh, that wouldn't really make sense. Um, and you know, you see here we have networking as another category. We really had to do that. We're going to do those live as well. So um, you know, you kind of have to decide which things you want in which format, and which are uh, which formats are going to best serve the needs of your audience and, and their expectations. Another thing to really consider is the timeline of your event. So obviously, an in-person event tends to take place over you know, consecutive days or at least consecutive hours, whereas an online event can really be spread out as much as you as you want. You can have, you know, sessions over days, over weeks, over months even. Um, and the upside of that is you avoid having attendees feel that Zoom fatigue of just constantly being staring at a screen and trying to absorb information. Um, but I think one downside of that is um, it's, it feels like less of an event, and it's just kind of a series of webinars. And so folks may be less likely to set aside the time to really um, be present and, you know, maybe put away other work that they're doing and really go to the event, <laughs> which you are maybe more likely to get with a more compacted timeline. Um, but if there are pros and cons, of course, um, one thing that can help is if you are uh, recording sessions, then you give people some more flexibility. They can choose whether they want to view the event when scheduled or whether they just are going to go check it out later. Um, so just another thing to consider with your audience in mind. And then, of course, there's communication, which is really important. Um, pretty much everyone involved in your event has a pretty good idea of how an in-person conference looks, what it's going to be like to attend or to present. But for an online event, it may be kind of a mystery, like what is it going to be like? How are people going to interact with me? Um, so what we did for our presenters was we had a shepherd model and we kind of borrowed this from another conference that we were looking at, where basically every presenter has a shepherd, quote unquote, who is uh, someone from our conference planning committee. And that person is the main point of contact for that presenter. That allowed them to feel comfortable, like I have someone I know I can talk to if I have questions. And it also allowed us to have standard information going out to everyone. So we know, you know, this everybody should know this basic information because their shepherd has been has sent it out to them. Um, and of course, you also want to make your guidelines for presentations clear uh, so folks can um, can prepare and you have some standardization among all of your presentations. And then for attendees, um, same sort of thing. Uh, they don't really know what to expect. So provide guidance for them. And if you can, provide it in multiple formats. So if you can provide text guidance, that's great. Um, we decided to also create a short little orientation video that will help them take full, uh, full uh, advantage of their conference experience and get a sense of what it will look like so that on the day of they feel more confident. Um, and I think part of that is painting a picture of their conference experience, letting them know like this is what it will be like and um, you know, if you don't see this, here's why, that sort of thing. And of course, obviously you wanna provide a lot of options for help. So we have um, a help email that we provide and then we're also setting up a Zoom meeting room that is just for folks to pop in and um, ask any questions that they have if that's the format that they prefer. So on the day of, event, of the event, there's a lot that needs to be considered. Um, 
So one thing is to really make sure the live events have a lot of support. Um, and I think this conference is a great example of, of doing that, making sure everyone feels comfortable. And when people are asking questions, there's someone to monitor that, um, which is what Kelly's doing. I think that's really great. Um, another thing you can do is use photos. So we have photos of past events. We are going to use them liberally <laughs> um, to kind of remind folks, you know, this is what this is. <laughs> you know, here's a familiar uh, site of, of in-person conference. This is that. It just looks a little bit different. And we also decided um, our planning committee took some photos of ourselves in Zoom doing some planning because, you know, we're not, we can't do a big group photo like the traditional way. But this allows us to show attendees, you know, the, here we are, we're your colleagues, and we're working on this event. We're, we're working really hard to make sure that this is valuable for you. And then, of course, make sure that you get a lot of feedback. Um, obviously, if this is a new thing for you, for your organization to move the event online, you're going to need a lot of uh, different sources of feedback. Um, we created a number of different surveys surveys for the different sessions, um, one for the overall event. Uh, we also created one for the presenters themselves about that experience of um, do they feel comfortable and prepared and supported. Um, one for the vendors, did they feel like this was a good uh, use of their time and money. And all of that can really help you um, if you decide that you do want to continue offering online events, maybe you know, it's the health issues aren't as severe in the future, but you still want to do it anyway because you found a lot of value. You can turn to those surveys to um, give you guidance on how to how to proceed with that planning. So just as a couple of general takeaways, I only have three minutes anyway. Um, moving an event online can have significant benefits in terms of savings, increased participation and environmental sustainability but many decisions must be made with your audience and tools in mind. So just as with any event, there are a lot of decisions involved. And um, hopefully this gives you some ideas of uh, options that are available to you. And so um, I'm gonna put the link to this, these slides in the chat, but there are some additional um, resources that I thought were helpful that are in the slides. So, um, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can answer any questions. Oops. So that's my link to the slides. I have a question, Mandy. Mm -hmm. How much of a lead up time would you recommend for planning? Um, well, certainly some groups um, back in like March and April, like made a really fast transition and kudos to them. But I would say definitely um, six months, I think was, was did, didn't feel like very long to us. And of course it depends on the scale of the event as well. What were the different kinds of ro uh, roles that were on your planning committee? Um, so we decided to do kind of like a, a sub team approach. So we had a small group, you know, who took care of designing the survey and a small group that um, was responsible for the website. Um, other folks that kind of, we had someone who was responsible for our communication, um, writing that out for us. Um, and I think that approach worked really well, kind of split it up in that way. We have another question. How much time did it take to build the website? Um, it took it took a couple of months to get the shell and then in the past six months things have slowly been added to it and there, a lot of the, the stuff isn't on there yet. During the actual conference there'll be a password sent out to all of the registrants and then the conference site will be password protected and all of the sessions will go live. So you can see a lot on there now but there'll be you know a lot more actual content in a couple of weeks. And we have a question. What is the biggest challenge for hosting an online event? Um, I would say the biggest challenge is is helping people with expectations. Um, they expect 
the event to be similar to what they're used to and in a lot of ways it won't be and so kind of helping to navigate them through that so that they still get a lot out of the event is probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope this was helpful. And thanks for your comments. These are great. I don't want to keep you from your next session. Bye, y'all. So we can stop recording now. Thank you everyone for coming.